Do you want to know how to play Divide Impera in the easiest way? Let me show you how. Hi players, bonjour from Paris, my name is Asaf Hirsch and welcome to my channel Easy Board Games. Today I'm going to show you how to play DEI Divide Impera, which is an area control game, deck building and a little bit of resource management. And since Ludus Magnus Studios in just a few days are going to have a new Kickstarter for a new expansion, I thought to myself, this should be a good time to have some videos about this game. So this video is going to be a setup and rules. Another video will be an explanatory playthrough slash tutorials. And another one will just give you my humble review. As always, if you learn something new, if you saw something that you like, please subscribe, like, comment to this video. This is an absolutely free way to support this channel. And uh, take your dog for a walk. God damn it, it's been hours ready to have the most resources and be declared as the winner, let's go to setup. All right, guys. So the first thing that we need to do in setup is to arrange all the districts. Now, the setup that you're seeing right now in front of you is a quick setup for two players as recommended by the rule book on page 27. Behind every uh, district, we have two numbers. The first one is like the code or the number of this specific uh, district. And the other number that we have is for how many players we can use this tile. So if, for example, we would like to do a three player a game or four player, we're just going to take the tiles that indicate three players or four players. The next step is to lay down all the neutral bridges. We'll talk about bridges a little bit later, of course, but what we're looking for is these signs right over here. And then we're going to put a neutral bridge just between them. The next thing that we want to do is to choose which factions are going to be active in this game. We will talk about the player setup a little bit later, but soon you'll understand why it's important right now. So for this uh, setup, I've chosen the faction, the Ravagers, and a uh, Refuge 42. Now, why is it important right now? The next step is to uh, take all the tokens of the active drones that we're going to have in this game, shuffle them, and put them in these two locations, right over here and right over there. Each faction has a drone that is, let's say, connected to it. For uh, the Ravagers, we have this drone over here, uh, that if I can pronounce its name correctly, it's uh, Masamun, but okay, it's this drone right over here. You can see this sign of the drone. So I need to take the token that is corresponding to it. And the same I'm going to do with the uh, Refuge 42, which is the other faction. And that drone is called a uh, Simon or Simon, since I live here in France. So I'm going to take these two tokens, I'm going to shuffle them. Let's call it a shuffle. And I'm going to randomly uh, put each token in the other place. After I did that, I'm going to flip those tokens. So here, for example, we have again this Masamun. And that means that on the other side, we're going to have Simo. The next thing that we want to do is sort of populate all the districts with the different resources. We have two kinds of resources. The first one is the technology, okay, that you can see uh, right over here or with the token that comes with the base game, of course, it doesn't matter. And the other one is uh, the energy cell token that we have over here. Uh, it's the purple color. Now, on the tiles, I'm going to try and do a little bit of a zoom in or show you a photo. We can see that we have two kinds of shapes on the districts. The first one is triangle that you can see over here or um, over here, for example. And the other shape that we have is a circle over here. So on each triangle, we're going to put down an energy cell token. And on each circle, we're going to put a technology token. Let me try and work a little bit on my uh, Premiere uh, Pro skills and see if I can do something nice. The rest of the resources we can put right over here. And right after that, we're going to take something that's called uh, the candy boost tokens will give them a good shuffle as usual this is the best shuffle that you'll ever see on youtube and we're going to put it also uh, in the supply accessible to all the players 
Next, we would like to take all the outposts. We have three colors, red, blue, and green, and put them on the different circles. Each uh, red outpost we're going to put on a circle with a letter A. Each blue outpost we're going to put on a circle with a letter B. And each green outpost we're going to put uh, on a circle with a letter Z. Nah, that was just a bad joke. You guessed it. With a letter C. Let's do it for the whole board. Next, we will take all the cubes in the corresponding colors and we will put a red dice uh, to a red outpost, a blue uh, cube for a blue outpost, and the same green for green. Right after that, we're going to put all the markets next to the board. So what are the markets? We have uh, four of them. We have the blue market, we have the red one, the green market, and the black market. Now we need to populate them sort of with uh, all their cards. But before we're doing that, we need to take something uh, that's called the drone cards and put them in the different markets. Now, again, we're going to play only with two factions. So we're going to take only six of those drone cards, one for uh, Masamun and the other one for uh, Simon or Simon or Simon. I'm going to stick to Simon. I think it's the easiest for me to say. So from these six cards, what we need to do is to uh, turn them to one pile, shuffle them, and split them into uh, three groups. So we have one over here, another one, and the third one. And now let's take, for example, the blue market uh, cards. We're going to take one, uh, two of those cards that we have, the drawn cards, and we're going to shuffle them inside this pile. When it's ready, we're going to take this deck of cards and put them next to the market, just like this. Let's do the same for the red market, the same with the green, and the black market that has this kind of cards, we're, we're not going to add anything to it, we're just going to give it a good shuffle and put it right next to the black market. Now, from each market, we're going to draw three cards and we're going to put them a visible facing up. Wonderful. The next step that we want to do is to take all the fit tokens, create three uh, different piles according to the color, of course, and we're going to put them uh, out of the shot. We're going to use them later when we'll talk about the player setup. Right after that, we're going to uh, look over here on the mission board, and the mission board has a few parts. Here on the upper part, we're going to have the turn order. At the bottom part, we're going to move this token, the triangle token, from round to round. We're going to have, in this game, four rounds. And here, the eight uh, uh, vacant places are for, actually, missions, okay, that the purebred is going to give us along the game. So, we're going to take all the purebred mission cards, again, give them a good shuffle, and in every free space, we're going to randomly choose a card and put it in one of those locations. After that, we're going to put the supply board over here. And this is actually our victory point uh, tracker. So we're going to put two, uh, the, two of these tokens, one for each faction. So again, we have the Ravagers and the uh, Refuge 42. And we're going to put them on the zero. The player setup is super easy. Each player needs to take the faction pad with their leader of the faction they have uh, chosen. In this case, we have the Ravagers with their leader, Abraham, and then all the uh, components in their color. So here we have the eight cards, the eight faction cards that we're going to put in our hand. We have three bridges, uh, the, the refuge uh, tokens, the elevator tokens, 15 scrappers and the leader figure. Each faction will then take from the supply one technology token, one energy cell token, and from the fit token supplies, we're going to take one red fit token, put it over here, one blue and one green. The last thing that we will do, we will take our uh, four of our faction tokens, 
which are these tokens right here, and we're going to put them at the bottom right side of our uh, faction pad. I want to talk about some concepts that we have in this game. Okay, so there are a few things. I'm going to mark them with this sign over here. Uh, whenever it's a concept rule that will help you understand the game better. The first concept that I would like to talk to you about is region anatomy. Okay, guys, if you understand this, and I will try to explain it the, in the best way that I can, I assure you that you already understood 50% of the game. So here what we have are nine districts. Now, each district has some regions in it. What does it mean, a region? Regions are some sort of territory, okay, let's call it like that, that is separated by some sort of a border. So if we take, for example, here, this uh, uh, area, okay, we have two kinds of borders. The first border is this one, okay? And since the art here is really cool, sometimes, or at least for me, maybe because I'm not the smartest guy in the world, it was a little bit confusing. But right over here, we have a little bit of a darker line. The second type of border is actually the difference between the ground floor that we have over here and the buildings, let's say, okay? So this is the first floor and right next to it is the second floor. But for this region, all of this over here around it are considered to be borders as well. So now if we're applying the, uh, the good terminology, okay, each area like this is called a region and each region is divided by some borders. Regions of the same level that are belonging, belonging to uh, one or more districts. So if we'll take again this region, for example, we have it's, it's built from four districts, as we can see, are considered, all of this is considered to be the same region, even though it belongs to four different districts. So now let's take uh, two regions that are adjacent to each other, okay? We'll take again this region right over here and this region right over here. We already agreed that this region is separated by the borders around it, right? And we have this region that is a, a, that has borders all around it here, if it's the, the, the black lines or the other floors. So this is a region and this one is a region and they're on the same uh, floor, let's say, on the same height, on the same level, whatever you want to call it. These districts are linked. Let's take this region, for example. So again, the borders are basically over here. Okay, so that is the, the, the building, right? We will not jump from the roof unless we have an elevator, but we'll talk again about it later. So even though this region is built from two different districts, again, it's considered to be the same region. This region over here is separated by this line. So again, this is one region, this is another one, they have a border, but they are on the same level. So they are considered to be linked. The next, a little bit confusing thing, but again, <laughs> probably it's just me. It's the difference between the first floor. Okay, so again, we have the ground level, we have the first level, and we have the second level. These two regions that we have on the first and on the second level are also linked. So now that we understood all the anatomy of the districts and the regions and everything, let's talk about what does every player uh, do on, on his or her turn. So for this setup, the Ravagers, the orange faction, are going to be the first player. And Refuge 42, the purple one, is going to be the second player. So in the beginning of each game, the first thing that each player is going to do before taking its first action is to deploy uh, the leader and in case of the first player okay again it's uh, the ravagers we're going to deploy the leader and two scrappers the next player the second one uh, in our case it's going to be refuge 42 is going to deploy its leader and three scrappers 
And of course, if we had a third player, it's going to be with four scrappers. And we had a fourth player, it's going to be five scrappers. As we said in the beginning, each game of a Divide Impera is divided into four turns. Each turn is going to be composed of three action phases and a cleanup phase. So the first player is going to, let me show you right over here. The first player is going to take its first uh, uh, turn or round. Okay, it's going to uh, play two cards. We're going to talk about it immediately. After that, the second player is going to do the first, uh, uh, the first action and the third player and so on. I'm going to take a turn and then Refuge 42 is going to take a turn. Then I'm going to take the second turn with something extra that we will talk about and the Refuge and then third Refuge and then I will do the cleanup. And uh, after Refuge 42 will do cleanup, we're going to uh, start our second, uh, second turn. So in my turn, I'm going to choose two cards to play from my hand into the board. So I think that it's uh, pretty crucial that we're going to uh, go over the different actions that we can take on our turn. I'm only going to talk about the basic actions and maybe one or two uh, special actions that we can take, but I'm not going to waste too much time on that because I think that if you understand the basic uh, actions, then for sure you'll understand the advanced actions. The first action that we'll be able to do is to enlist. So every time I'm going to play a card with this icon right over here, I'm going to be able to enlist one scrapper for each icon uh, of this enlist action on my card. In this case, it's going to be two scrappers because we have two icons of enlisting. We're going to take from our supply two scrappers, right? This is what we had on our card. And we're going to put it uh, to put them, I'm sorry, on the neutral refuge. In order for us to talk about the next two actions that we can take on our turn, I want to uh, tell you about another concept that we have here uh, that is called the majority rule. So this is pretty much a, a numerical value that is determined by how many units I have in a specific region. So right now I have five units in this region of the neutral camp. And by the way, the leader is considered only as one unit. It's not like uh, two scrappers or something like that. So right now I have five units. It means that right now I have the majority, which is pretty obvious because we don't have any other units. But what happens if I add here another scrapper? So of course I still have the majority, but according to the rule book, there is a concept that is called supremacy, which means that I have a majority in a region where there is at least one unit of a rival faction. Here I have supremacy and if I, uh, if I add here, sorry, uh, more scrappers right now, there is still supremacy, right? Five of mine and four of uh, Refuge 42. But now that Refuge 42 has five of its units, units exactly like mine, now we're in a tie. The next action that I would like to talk to you about is the movement. So what does it mean to move? First of all, I need to play a card with the icon of this uh, boot, okay? This black boot, this is a movement card, or sorry, a movement action. Whenever I have this icon in a card, ignore this for one moment, please. So whenever I have this icon on a card, that means I can do one movement. So when I'm doing this action, I can take as many uh, units, okay, leaders, scrappers, whatever, as many units that I want from one region to another linked region. So for example, I can take only one scrapper or two or all of them. But the only way that I'll be able to do it is if at the end of the movement, I have majority in the region that I moved to. Let's talk about the next action that I can do, which also requires majority or supremacy, and that is the collect action. So each time I'm playing a card with this icon, for each collect icon that I have on my card, I'm able to gather one resource. In this case that we have over here, I'm not able to collect anything because in my region, there are no resources. So let's say just for this example that this scrapper over here is in this region. Now that I played my card, 
since I have majority here, right? I have one scrapper and there are no other factions. I'm able to collect one resource. In this case, it's going to be the technology token, the technology resource. So I've played my card. Let's put it right here on my board. I played my second action. And now I'm going to gather one technology token and I'm going to put it on my board just like this. Before we're going to move on to talk about uh, the buy action, I want to talk to you about outposts and you will understand why in just one moment. Every time I'm going to finish my uh, movement or my action with a majority in an area, on a region, I'm sorry, uh, that has an outpost, I'm going to take this cube and I'm going to put it on my board just like this, which signifies that I have, uh, that I'm controlling more like, uh, it's better to say that I'm controlling right now one red outpost. If the next player, Refuge42, is going to do some sort of movement and he will finish his movement when he has supremacy in the same region that I'm controlling uh, uh, this outpost, I will need to give him this cube to this player. So the player will take this red cube and will put it in his board exactly in the same way. Now let's go back to the next action, which is the buy action. In each market row, we have uh, the possibility to buy one of three cards. The rightmost card has no restrictions. It means that I can buy the rightmost card at any point when I'm doing the buy action. Of course, I will need to pay for uh, the card. Here in the, uh, the green card will cost me two uh, energy cell resources. Here two, ener uh, not energy, two technology tokens or resources. And the blue is the same like the green. Uh, it will cost me to buy this card two energy cell resources. Let's go to the card in the middle. In order for us to buy the card in the middle, we need to control either a one green outpost or one red outpost or one blue outpost. If you remember, now the Ravagers, the orange player is controlling one red outpost. So from the middle cards, from all the rows, I'm able to buy only uh, from the red market. And I think you already understood how it will go for the leftmost card, which for us to buy uh, these cards uh, is going to, uh, well, the restriction is that we need to control either two uh, green outposts or two red outposts or two blue outposts. Very important to add that when we want to buy a card from the market rows, we need to play a card from our hand facing down just like this. Uh, later on, after we're going to uh, do our cleaning phase, we're going to take this card and put it over here in our recycle bin area. Each time that we're buying a card, we're going to take it into our hand. So I'm going to pay the cost, which is two energy cell resources. Okay, so let's say I have it in my board. I'm putting it back in the main supply. I'm going to take this card into my hand. So now it's part of my hand. I'm going to put it uh, uh, with me. And now what I need to do is to advance the other card to the middle and open a new one. Now let's talk about the black market for one moment. Now the unique uh, uh, the, that we have in the black market is that we can see here we have no restrictions. That means that at any point of the game, we can buy any one of the three cards as long as we can pay it its uh, a cost. The only thing that we have are the variables of the cost. In this example, this card costs one energy cell token and one technology token, but with a variable, we'll need to add to its cost one technology token. So for us to buy this card, we'll need to pay two technology tokens and one energy cell token. This card on the other side costs three energy cell tokens, but the variable says that after we purchased it, it means after we paid its cost, we will receive one technology token. Every time we're going to play a card with this icon over here, we know that we can build one of three things. The first one is a refuge, the second is a bridge, and the third one is an elevator. Let's talk about the first one, 
which is a refuge. So, so far, we know that when we're enlisting, we're going to deploy our scrappers to this neutral uh, camp or refuge. Now, if for example, I'm going to build a camp, uh, a refuge, I'm sorry, and I can build only where I have at least one uh, scrapper, which is kind of logic, right? I need someone to build it, but pay attention, I don't need here a majority or uh, a supremacy. Then I'm going to use my build action to put here in this region, okay? It's not only in the district, it's in all the region. Now, every time that I will enlist, I can choose if I want to deploy my scrappers to the neutral refuge or to my refuge. Now, if this is a refuge in my color, it belongs to my faction, I'm the only player that is able to deploy uh, scrappers to this location. And it doesn't have to be only in this region, it can be on the first floor or on the second floor, uh, it, it's only up to you. The next thing that we can build is an elevator. Now on the map, we have uh, two elevators that are neutral. That means that we can already use them. We have an elevator over here and we have a neutral elevator right over here. What does an elevator do? It actually links between two regions. Which regions? Over here the, on the ground floor, okay, in this region, to this region, which is on the first floor. So only if my scrapper is over here, I can move with one movement, of course, from the ground level to the first level. It's very important to see that the elevator is connected to this region. It means that I cannot take the elevator, even if it's in this region, I cannot take it to this first floor. No, this is not possible. Uh, uh, and not to here, not here, only to the place that it is uh, attached to, okay? Let's say it like that. So the next thing that I can do is to build an elevator. We already said this is a neutral one, so all the factions can use it. But let's say that I have a scrapper over here and I want to be able to move to this region over here, which is on the first floor. I'm sorry, he uh, went to sleep a little bit then I can use an action in order to build an elevator. It's very important that I'm going to attach the elevator between the two regions, okay? To the region of the, to the, region of the first floor. So right now, because this is an orange a, a elevator that belongs to the Ravagers faction, with one movement, now I will be able to move from this region to this one because they are linked with the elevator. No other faction, just like we have with camps, will be able to use this elevator. Let's talk about the third thing that we can build, which is the bridge. So again, we need to have at least one a, a scrapper in order to build it, right? It makes sense, we need someone to build it. And we can connect two rooftops that are in the same district. Pay attention because this is important. Just like we have over here, we have two rooftops that are linked now with this bridge. It means that to move from this area, from this region to this region, I only need one movement because they are linked and it has to be in the same district. So let's say that on my turn, I decided to build here a bridge. Now what I need to do is to put the, build, the bridge just like this. And these two rooftops are now linked. Now let's talk about the next action, which is not really basic and not really advanced, and that is controlling the drones. So first of all, as a concept, the drones don't belong to any faction. Each faction starts with one card that controls a, a specific drone. So for the Ravagers, the orange faction, their starting a card is with a Masamun, so they will be able to control it. But of course, if you remember, that we mixed uh, different drone cards into the markets, at some point they're going to come up and different factions will be able to acquire these cards 
and use them to control again the different drones. Each time that I'm going to play a drone card into my, uh, into my uh, board, I will be able to activate it. To activate drones, we have a few restrictions before I'm going to show you how we're actually going to do it. The first thing is before uh, uh, taking the action, a drone must perform the movement. I can choose not to move at all. That is uh, not a problem, but I cannot collect or do the action and then move. I first of all need to move and then I will be able to do the action that correspond to the drone. In this case, over here with this drone, it will be to collect. The second thing is that the drone movement ignores, of course, a majority rule. Again, which makes sense because they are all neutral, okay? They don't belong to a specific faction. Then we can say that a drone can move between adjacent uh, regions and ignoring completely rooftops or, or uh, from the first floor or the second or the ground. That means that, let's say I'm going to move with Masamun two steps. I can move one and two. Obviously, they wanted to show us very much that these drones are, are huge and they're doing basically whatever they want. Each drone can move up to two regions every, each time it is activated. And the last thing is that multiple uh, drones can occupy the same region. Again, thematically, they don't belong to, uh, to a specific faction, so there is no problem, for example, to Masamun to share the same uh, region with Simon, just like this. The next thing that I would like to talk to you about is this uh, candy boost. So these candy boosts are basically uh, some bonuses that you can acquire from different things in the game. Uh, I'm going to show it to you in the playthrough, but let's say that you acquired, a, for example, a, a candy boost that has the boot on it. So this is something that you can add at any point to a card that you're playing in order to gain a, another a movement action. So after I finished my first uh, uh, action phase, and Refuge 42 did their action, a uh, first action phase. I'm going to take the second action phase, but at the end of it, we're going to have uh, something extra. So at the end of the second action phase, we're going to look over here at the uh, Fitz tokens. And if at the end of the second action phase, I control at least two of the same uh, uh, outposts, so let's say, for example, that I'm controlling two red outposts, I will be able to permanent, permanently, I'm sorry, that's a big word for a person like me, I will be able to flip this fit token and have a permanent a special ability. Even if I will lose control over a one or two a outpost, this special power will still be left on my board and I will still be able to use it. The same goes for the blue uh, fit token and the same for the green fit token. That happens only after the second uh, action phase. At the end of the third action phase, we will need to do something that's called completing a mission. So pay attention over here to the purebred uh, mission board. So basically what it means that the purebred thematically, of course, has uh, have given us some uh, missions that we need to complete. So we finished the third action phase. Now we need to take one of our uh, faction tokens and put it on one of the cards. As you can see, each card has an upper part and a bottom part. Basically what they're saying is they're giving you a condition and they're saying for each uh, whatever is on the, uh, the left, you're going to get the amount of victory points or supply, let's call supply points uh, on the right. So in this card, for example, uh, after I have completed, okay, this mission, I'm going to put my uh, uh, faction token over here. And it means that for each technology token that I have on my board, I'm going to receive one supply point, okay? One victory point. Basically what it says here on the bottom part of it is for every three technology uh, tokens or resources that I have on my board, I will receive two supply points. So you might ask me, wait, uh, Asaf, how, like, why should I complete the, the bottom part of the mission 
if the, the top part is obviously much better. You can see that each a, a column of missions is actually a, a correspond to a specific turn of the game. Let's say that uh, in the first uh, turn, okay, so the first time that I have uh, completed my third uh, action phase, I need to complete the mission, and I'm going to put it here. That means that I'm accomplishing this mission on time. Why on time? Because it's either the present, okay, or something in the future, but in any case. So if I'm completing a mission on time or later on, I have to complete the top part of the mission. Now pay attention, once I have put my uh, faction token on a, in, on a specific card in a column, I will not be able to complete another mission on the same column. So if I've uh, again accomplished this mission right over here, this mission card is dead to me for the rest of the game. I will not be able to complete it. Now, let's say that we are on the uh, third round of the game. So let's move this token that indicates it over here and uh, ignore one moment that there are no missions accomplished. It's just for the example. If I'm completing a past mission, okay, that means a mission that is behind uh, uh, the turn that is indicated, I have to put it on the bottom part of the card. So I can only comp uh, accomplish the bottom part of the mission. After all the players have finished their uh, three action phases, each player on its turn going to do a cleanup phase. So in each cleanup phase, we're going to do three things. So each card like this that is face down is going to come over here to our a recycle bin and we're not going to be able to use this card until a, a we're counting the points. So this card is basically out of our reach for a, the a, a, for the rest of the game. All the other cards that are facing up are going to be returned into our hand and then we're going to move the turn marker uh, to the next turn. After all the players have finished their cleanup phase, we're going to recalculate the turn order. We're just going to look at the supply board and change the orders. So let's say, for example, our supply board looks like this. So as we can see, the Ravagers at the end of the cleanup have four supplies and the Refugee 42 have only two supplies. In this case, of course, you already understand it. It's to give an advantage. We're going to switch the priority uh, order. So now Refuge 42 are going to be the first player and uh, Ravagers are going to be the second one. If we have a tie, we're just going to uh, switch the priority. So let me give you an example. Let's say that at the end of the first turn, we have a tie. In order to break the tie, we're just going to switch it. After the fourth and final turn, we're going to count the points. Now, pay attention over here to the um, purebred mission board, and you'll see that on the right side, uh, we can see how much points we're going to add to our already uh, uh, supply board. Mm -hmm. 